I have a, a half dozen questions that I've scribbled down, but I may have an opportunity to chat with you uh, elsewhere. And so uh, I am pleased to uh, entertain questions from the audience. And I can appoint at you. Maybe you can mention your name if I don't know it and uh, introduce yourself to Dr. Oral. Who wants to get us started? No, I can actually recognize you. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you know Volodya. So. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Noah. I am a student in the Non-Proliferation Studies Dual Degree Program between MIS and MGMO, uh, which Dr. Orlov is uh, one of the founders of. So you, you touched on this uh, very closely a couple of times, but uh, I'm curious as to your gut reaction of the four scenarios. Um, Wendy Sherman, who was one of the negotiators of the deal, said at the uh, Moscow Non-Proliferation Conference, in regards to Trump's accusation that Iran is violating the spirit of the deal, the JCPOA is not a spiritual agreement, it is a nuts and bolts technical agreement. Mm -hmm. um, as embarrassing as this is for me to admit, I think that uh, scenario B, where Trump bluffs and sort of nobody listens, um, is the most likely. But um, regardless of what your European colleagues tell you and the Iranians are saying, what is sort of your gut feeling as to uh, what we're looking at in the next like three to six months? Well, uh, I think, you know, just uh, doing some predictions would be too uh, risky, particularly as I'm now here in friendly Monterey, and my trip uh, to Washington is in my schedule uh, later uh, this uh, month, so uh, my Thanksgiving uh, will be in a completely different uh, environment. And, you know, I uh, tried, you know, just to take some antidote before I go uh, to uh, uh, Washington. Uh, but uh, actually, when I'm there, it probably will be a better reality check <laughs> what's what's really going on and uh, have meetings uh, there. Um, I think uh, when, when uh, you uh, called uh, Wendy Sherman, she was actually very good at that uh, uh, conference and at that panel, I believe. Uh, and uh, I also do think uh, that uh, there is uh, n n not such a question as spirit uh, of uh, the agreement uh, and just having some uh, impression of uh, the way how the deal was uh, in uh, the making. Uh, from, uh, well, uh, that open phase from uh, November uh, 2013 uh, to uh, June, July uh, 2015. Uh, I should say uh, this is a very good deal. This is very professionally done deal. Uh, uh, so why should we add some spirits uh, inside? Uh, I, I just uh, do not know. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that if uh, my feeling were completely relaxed, uh, you know, just okay, you know, Trump wants just to decertify once, uh, and uh, that's it, and uh, just then we mm, uh, go further with uh, what we have, uh, Iranian is put on alert, but things go still more or less, well, uh, that's, that's maybe the case. Uh, but uh, I always have the feeling uh, that uh, the left hand in Washington doesn't know what the right hand is. And how many hands there, I uh, just a little bit you know, lost in uh, counting. And, uh, it's possible the right hand hasn't been appointed yet. And it's still <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, you, you know, uh, just to be fair uh, to uh, Washington Byzantium these days, uh, I remember Moscow Byzantium in the mid 90s when uh, also it was a little bit difficult to guess you know, who makes uh, what decision and in what stage of what intoxication, right? Uh, so uh, I, I have my own stories and only happy now that I don't need you know, to read that you know, decision making uh, things uh, in Moscow now. It's, it's, it's crystal clear, right? This is two different ways how two different democracies work. <laughs> Right. Uh, and um, uh, this this is why it's it's slightly uh, difficult for me here, uh, maybe you now without uh, really talking to people uh, on the hill uh, mm -hmm. and around uh, to, uh, to 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 get my answer. But I'm worried, you know, when uh, at, at least when I'm on, maybe I come to Washington. Okay, 
that's all gold mines here, that's all under control and under good management. Uh, but uh, on the distance when I was uh, October 15, uh, just looking at uh, this uh, news returning uh, to Moscow from Paris, uh, I was worried. I thought completely wrongly, completely wrongly, that last minute statement of Trump would not be the certification. It would be all warnings of Iran uh, saying, well, guys, you should be careful here, I'm watching you, you know, uh, but not the certification. And I, I, I got wrong. Some of my colleagues, uh, including uh, American colleagues who I had discussed this issue just a few days before that, uh, including people who are very, very Republican people, uh, they told me uh, he will not be certified. Uh, which means uh, that uh, I probably should be here on less risky side and just uh, see those scenarios in a more realistic rather than optimistic way and realistic way is not uh, doesn't sound very good probably your sources are probably speaking to the american secretary of state which is why i'm uh, surprised by what uh what actually said um well i want the thing is i I'll, i will ask a question here um i'm uh interested in uh when I see a kind of a trilateral relationship, which I find somewhat difficult to um, to understand. Uh, the, the first kind of leg of that triangle uh, has to do with Russian-Israeli relations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you emphasize uh, how uh, close today the personal relationship was between uh, the leadership of Russia uh, and Israel. Uh, I know I have conversations with my Egyptian friends and my Israeli friends, and they talk about this remarkably close relationship at the highest levels between Israel and Egypt. Uh, and then uh, you, I think, have removed the question mark uh, from the, the title in terms of this remarkably close relationship, at least today, between Russia. Uh, and Iran. And so there's a, one question is how do you kind of coexist in this uh, relationship that is Russia with Israel, uh, Russia with Iran, given the big question mark in terms of the Israeli um, uh, Iranian situation uh, on the nuclear side and, and beyond. And then further kind of compounding uh, this uh, I don't know if mystery is the right word, but complex uh, set of relations uh, is what I saw actually as even a more important budding, if not a romance, between the Saudis uh, and the Russians, which are, is also you know, harder to explain in terms of the current uh, difficult, say the least, relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So I can understand Russia wanting to have influence over uh, the region and the importance of establishing good ties with all the parties, but it seems to me at some point it's going to be very difficult for Russia to move much further in terms of their relationship with Iran at the same time that it has this remarkable relationship with Israel as it tries to build up its relations with, you know, with the Saudis. Um, I don't know how they do that. Uh, and so I'm trying... So, that's the, the picture that I'm trying to understand. To make a more precise question, however, can you help me better understand the current intensity and positive nature of the Russian-Israeli relationship? Uh, because it is, I mean, I could explain it in part because of the diaspora in Israel. That exists for a long time, and it didn't seem to have impact Russian relations that much. If you could say a little bit about that, that's the kind of the, the scene that I'm trying to better understand. Yeah, uh, actually, good news is that the coexistence you refer to in that triangle is so far peaceful coexistence, at least on the Russian uh, side, with both uh, separately. Um, uh, let me start uh, with uh, Russian-Israeli uh, uh, strategic uh, partnership, uh, if you like. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that uh, 
two parties agree on all the issues. Clearly, not on all the issues. Uh, diaspora plays a certain role, not that huge role. Uh, I think more importantly is the relationship on two levels, which sometimes complement each other, sometimes contradict each other. First is uh, the top level um, you know, of uh, political leadership. Uh, the second is uh, the level uh, of uh, the uh, military and intelligence. Uh, and uh, of course, when it comes uh, to political leadership, uh, this is where uh, the close advisors to uh, both Prime Minister Netanyahu and to President Putin, saying advisors, I mean informal advisors, of course, members of their teams, uh, have a significant uh, say, uh, including, well, but that's nothing related specifically uh, to. <clears throat> Iran or things like that, uh, these are more players uh, involved uh, in uh, the financial uh, sphere, uh, in the banking sphere, uh, who uh, both Putin and Netanyahu, for different reasons, uh, listen uh, very uh, closely. It is also true that uh, President Putin uh, is uh, quite uh, close with the uh, Jewish uh, uh, leaders uh, in uh, Moscow are uh, and uh, actually are uh, is a dialogue with the Jewish relig uh, re religious uh, leaders in Moscow it stretches uh, through many uh, many years so it's not a new uh, phenomena mm -hmm. now when it comes to uh, mill to mill uh, and uh, intelligence to um, the level I can uh, see it, uh, uh, this is a specifically fruitful, uh, uh, mostly non-controversial uh, relationship on specifically on counter-terrorism issue and uh, to a certain extent uh, on the uh, geopolitics uh, in uh, the Middle East, but at some point going as far as Russian-US relations because you cannot discuss the Middle East uh, without uh, American uh, factor in mind and consequently Russian US relations. Uh, so, uh, Syria here is, of course, number one, number two, and number three. Uh, Iran may go somewhere in that uh, top, but not necessarily on uh, the first place. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, Bill, uh, that uh, in uh, the Israeli uh, uh, practitioners uh, community who do not need to give you know speeches to the Israeli electorate uh, the view is prevailing that Iran remains naturally potential partner for Israel and the region and uh, that of course is something which they cannot you know articulate uh, uh, on the public but they work on that they work on the understanding that dealing with a stable, predictable, non-nuclear weapon, Iran would be good for Israel, would be in Israel's interest, uh, and not uh, playing with less predictable and maybe uh, more likely to collapse regimes like Saudi Arabia. But uh, I respect the fact that it's also part of Israeli domestic debate and not necessarily uh, at all times they have the consensus. It's also true uh, that Israelis just never will put all the eggs in one basket. And here maybe the Russians are learning uh, to a certain extent. Uh, here, and this is partly uh, a response uh, to your uh, question how Russia can deal with those uh, multiple players in the region. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Russia sees no problem with the improving relations with Saudi Arabia. Uh, the question is that Russia doesn't want to pay the price for that. Russia believes in this particular case that these are Saudis who should pay the price. But the price should not include, as part of the package, removal of some specific personalities from some specific leadership positions. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, the trust 
uh, and confidence are not those words that uh, you use uh, in the Middle East uh, often, and particularly in Saudi Arabia. Uh, is involved, we still have our memories uh, of uh, Saudi involvement uh, in uh, Afghanistan when the Soviet Union was there uh, in the most ugly way, uh, and we still uh, have not all the memories, but just witnessing uh, Saudi uh, provocative uh, behavior uh, in uh, Syria, this Saudi money. Uh, which uh, uh, lead uh, to a lot of deaths, the, the Saudi provocations, which make many of us uh, being uh, busy uh, for, um, unfortunately, for, for, for a bad reason. But here there is one more part of the triangle, which you I mean this is Iran. And here I'm trying to explain how it is viewed from Russia. It is absolutely true that not necessarily Iran here is a passive player, and definitely is not just looking at the Russian-Israeli intimate, intimate relationship happily and applauding to that. Uh, there were so many times when uh, Iranians said, well, we were not cheating. <coughs> we were just hiding some facts from you. <laughs> because we know that the next morning people in Israel would learn it from you guys. And uh, we did it just for our own uh, safety and security in not sharing this information with you. So, of course, there are problems like that. And I may guess that there may be some issues Russia and Iran discussed, which not necessarily fully shared between Russia and Israel. This, 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 is, <coughs> uh, this, this is nothing very unusual here. But the question is, uh, what is the level of Iranian resistance here to... Uh, um, uh, a Russian-Israeli uh, uh, close relationship. Um, of course, we didn't touch upon at all uh, such issues as Hezbollah. We didn't discuss at all um, uh, related uh, activities, which some may see as liberation, others may see uh, as uh, terrorist activity. Um, uh, they also are uh, kind of part of the broad uh, uh, agenda Mm, but uh, I will probably not go uh, into uh, detail uh, here. Uh, I'm not sure where that stage when uh, Russia would mediate between Iran uh, and Israel. I'm not sure where at that stage when uh, Iran and Israel would enter in some kind of deterrence, uh, at least conventional deterrence uh, discussions. Uh, but uh, I would not be completely surprised, though, uh, if uh, Russia would be happy uh, to see not only Iranians and Americans talking intimately about all the things, not only nuclear but also regional, uh, but uh, we would be happy to see Israelis and Iranians talking bilaterally on removing the most poisonous uh, issues from their own um, bilateral agenda. I'm not sure where at this stage now but uh, it may come. Thank you very much. So, yes, I did you. Uh, hello, Dr. Olov. Uh, I'm Sylvia Nisha. Presently, I'm based in uh, CNS. I've been, uh, Sylvia. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Formerly, I've been uh, a researcher with the New Delhi based research ORF. Uh, sure. Uh, so, um, thank you so much for your uh, fascinating uh, remarks. Uh, I learned a lot, but my question veers more uh, towards uh, the geopolitical aspects and which you uh, touched upon briefly on the transportation corridor. And uh, recently when Prime Minister uh, Modi uh, visited um, Russia, the initiative uh, on the international north-south corridor got an uh, important impetus. Uh, what I wanted to understand from you is uh, that at the time when uh, there are concerns about U.S. drawdown of troops and uncertainty in Afghanistan, do you think uh, India, Iran, and uh, <coughs> Russia would be able to collaborate uh, significantly uh, towards uh, bolstering uh, economics and trade and commerce through the international uh, north-south corridor? That is one. But uh, increasingly, there is also a trend uh, that uh, these three countries are uh, essentially pulling apart and they have divergent views on uh, the ISIS, the Islamic State and also the uh, uh, Taliban uh, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. So do you think that these are some of the 
a broader concern that would act as an uh, hindrance or obstacle the push or the development towards the international law service mm. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for your questions and indeed your uh, previous work in the ORF, I think, are, um, I think will be very helpful for you in just shaping uh, this question because this is ORF. Uh, who uh, is doing, uh, in my view, an initiated, a very important trilateral work between Russia, Iran, and uh, India uh, on uh, this uh, specific uh, issue. And I know that it was uh, hopeful in times, very frustrating, particularly when uh, our group met in uh, Tehran. Uh, you also, well, Nanda uh, Krishna, of course, uh, does a lot uh, on that, but Rakesh Suv has his uh, great uh, expertise, particularly on uh, Afghanistan and, of course, uh, beyond. Uh, I think we all, um, three of us, uh, India, Iran, uh, and Russia, do share the need uh, to have uh, that safe transportation corridor as soon as possible being fully are efficient, fully in place are because uh, our business communities need it and because our strategic interests need it. And I think uh, both uh, elements are equally uh, important. And this is uh, also shared by other players like uh, Azerbaijan. Afghanistan uh, is a problem. Uh, we are never really explored uh, the opportunity uh, through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, where uh, it should be not the United States and NATO, but uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization members uh, who could really fix Afghanistan. Are, and uh, of course, we uh, should not ignore uh, one more player here, which is China, which is not uh, the player in this uh, particular. China has its own uh, corridors uh, somehow uh, competing uh, with uh, what we're doing, but that's fine. Uh, mm, uh, this is more a question of stability in uh, Afghanistan uh, that uh, worries me a lot. Uh, we have a lot of discussion on what can be done. We did, uh, unfortunately, very little uh, to prove that ASEO here can be uh, really an efficient and important player. Uh, Iran is not yet a full member of the ASEO, which, in my view, uh, is not right. It must be uh, changed, but regardless of who member or what, um, uh, the issue of Afghanistan should be much more in the hands of the regional uh, players, including uh, Iran, uh, India, uh, and Russia. But there are two footnotes here. The first, uh, Russia has its clear limits in involvement in Afghanistan for historic reasons. We would love to play a more active role in Afghanistan, uh, but militarily we will not be there. Uh, so this is a clear limitation we have now. Uh, Syria and would like to uh, play there uh, right. Uh, the second footnote, uh, of course, uh, some of us in Russia look very carefully at uh, India's foreign policy uh, and when we uh, exchange notes with Iranian colleagues you know, we of course uh, see uh, that uh, uh, although uh, through the words we have no contradictions between Russia and India uh, in practical terms uh, India under uh, uh, Modi was drifting towards the United States at least it was the fact with the Obama administration uh, but uh, we are actually uh, see it uh, through different uh, international fora and uh, even uh, bilaterally, which uh, makes some uh, most sensitive strategic decisions involving more than two partners uh, slightly uh, more uh, difficult. Okay. Any other questions before I turn around? <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, I, I'll ask another question here. Um, so, um, you touched upon Russian concerns about Iranian proliferation behavior. Mm -hmm. You expressed a recognition that uh, uh, Russia had no interest whatsoever in Iran uh, pursuing a, a, 
nuclear weapons program. Um, there have been a number of accounts uh, recently, as well as in the past, uh, suggesting uh, Iranian DPRK collaboration in WMD and delivery system area. Uh, there are, I think, an increasing number of, of uh, suggestions of uh, both uh, Iranian uh, Iranian presence in, in the DPRK, collaboration in the missile sector, um, and given the uh, potential unraveling of the JCPOA, uh, not to mention the financial difficulties which the DPRK is experiencing, uh, one could imagine uh, a growth in whatever relationship currently exists between those two countries. Um, given Russia's very close relationship with Iran today, and what many regard as a budding relationship between Russia and the DPRK, how does Russia regard the potential for greater Iranian DPRK interaction in the military sector? Yeah, well, it actually depends what we are talking about here specifically. Uh, uh, no question, no doubt, uh, military <coughs> cooperation between uh, DPRK and Iran goes on. That's, uh, that's the thing. And uh, I would even be surprised if it didn't, uh, because uh, for uh, different reasons, but those two countries just were. Uh, left uh, together uh, uh, because some other ties and some other opportunities for uh, them uh, have been closed now specifically for uh, the uh, DPRK uh, although when you speak about uh, opportunities for financial uh, channels it would be really in my view difficult for DPRK uh, to use here uh, Iranian uh, financial uh, instrument uh, financial center and um, so mail to mail yes uh, missile yes uh, when it comes to nuclear uh, I'm not sure uh, I just uh, do not uh, have that evidence myself so I would be reluctant to speculate on the things uh, I'm uh, not uh, uh, aware of. Uh, I'm uh, personally impressed uh, of the progress uh, of uh, DPRK's uh, nuclear program and we all know uh, on the other side uh, that uh, Iranian uh, scientists and engineers have made really very important uh, progress uh, in their uh, work uh, in uh, recent decades, but whether uh, these two uh, things uh, connect uh, between them and that uh, can only hypothetically connect. Uh, I'm agnostic um, uh, here. Uh, actually, uh, when we say uh, isolate uh, DPRK, uh, we're in Russia bordering DPRK and following uh, very closely our DPRK uh, trade ties with uh, other players, whatever it is, uh, Malaysia here, Cuba there. Um, uh, we see that uh, in the current world, you just cannot fully isolate anyone. Yes, you can be, do quite painful things, and particularly when you're really close, some specific Macau-based account, yes, you do some. <laughs> some things which uh, make the other side uh, specifically uh, unhappy. Uh, but sealing the country from the world, unless the country itself is ready to seal itself, uh, it uh, is um, uh, impossible. Uh, so wherever we would find uh, DPRK uh, footprints uh, in uh, Iran, or again in Pakistan, maybe not in Pakistan as it is, but in some other country. Uh, this is, uh, of course, an interesting question. We will be following it, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sure. Um, and uh, the Russia's view uh, here is uh, that uh, by uh, further isolating uh, the PRK, we will not heal the problem. We can address certain elements of the problem. Uh, but uh, not uh, holistically addressed. 
uh, it. Two holistic addresses we need to address, and we discussed it in a completely different uh, lecture on a different subject, I think, um, uh, yesterday here. Uh, that uh, you need uh, just a comprehensive uh, approach respecting our security our concerns uh, of uh, the country. Uh, so cutting it uh, from uh, the whole world, whether it's Iran or others, uh, will not have. Uh, having uh, said that, I think it is in Russia's interest, as I read them, uh, not uh, to see further progress of uh, DPRK's uh, nuclear weapon program, and it is clearly not uh, in the Russia's interest or any uh, clandestine, uh, any non-peaceful related attempts uh, by uh, Iranian colleagues. Just to be very frank, I'm not IAEA, I uh, sees it all now, uh, w w watches it very carefully. I do not see any disturbing signs on the Iranian side here, speaking on Iran specifically on the nuclear issue. Can I, one, just one last uh, question, at least for me. Um, <clears throat> there is a, uh, a record of substantial Iranian uh, student uh, study in Russia in the past. I mean, you and I actually I think, looked at some of this in the, in the missile sector uh, like some time ago. Uh, given the increased partnership in the economic sector uh, between Russia and Iran, uh, can one also chart, are there any figures which suggest uh, a growing Iranian presence at places like MIFI or other uh, uh, institutes in the technology sector. I, I, out of curiosity, without trying to read more into that, I, I would think it would be natural, uh, but I haven't seen any figures to suggest that there has been uh, a surge in this uh, it, it, area. It is a surge, and it goes uh, both in technology and in uh, humanities. Uh, just uh, recently, uh, it was established uh, a club of rectors of Iranian and Russian universities uh, who meet regularly. Uh, and uh, of course, there are government, uh, Russian government programs that explicitly support our Iranian students in different areas, excluding the most sensitive areas uh, into. Russia. So we expect uh, the figures just to grow, I would say, not two, three, but tenfold. Yeah, maybe we have to expand our dual degree and not look for extra studies. To well, we study. have uh, actually a third leg. an <laughs> a application from uh, an Iranian for that dual degree with Canadian passport, which is, <laughs> make, makes things easier. <laughs> uh, before we close here, I just want, there was one thing that I meant to say by way of introduction, and maybe this is a way to encourage Dr. Orloff to come back and to address uh, yet a different thing. Uh, many of you may not know that uh, there was, in fact, a, a very interesting Russian presence in Hawaii. And uh, Dr. Orloff is the one person I know who probably, for both professional reasons and also because he likes Hawaii, uh, has uh, invested in research on this subject. And there, in fact, will be a conference uh, in Hawaii uh, addressing this issue. And so what I'd like to do is to extend an invitation informally to you, uh, Volodya, uh, that when you have some more concrete uh, findings from your research on the Russian-Hawaii relationship to come back and to, uh, to share uh, them with us. So please join me in thanking Dr. Olaf for a fascinating